there is a level of condescension that exists in the wine industry. When you talk to everyday wine consumers who aren't scholars of wine, they're frustrated by it. There's a reason people feel afraid to share their thoughts on wines. There's a reason they feel intimidated in a restaurant to order wine. There's a reason they find it elitist and scary. It's supposed to be this product of pleasure and inclusion and bringing people together. So let's not make it this scary beast. Absolutely. It's one of the first things I had to get over in starting a podcast. I've been writing about wine for 20 years. I still had to get over. What if I say something wrong? You have to move beyond your own ego, but also open yourself up to be vulnerable and to be corrected and hope that someone does it kindly rather than the other way. I mean, Natalie, I'm sitting here body tense, clenching myself in case I say something (laughs) wrong about wine. The wine industry loves to beat people up. Let's not do that anymore. Yeah. Inclusion. Call in. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 127. What makes someone a wine influencer? Why is there so much uproar in the wine industry about celebrity wines and influencers? How did heavy drinking become such an entrenched part of the wine industry? And do you sometimes feel that you drink too much? Our guest this week has answers for you, well, on at least those first three questions, plus lots of great wine tips and stories. I've got a bonus for you in addition to this podcast. I'd love for you to join me in the premiere watch party of the video of this conversation that I'll be live streaming for the very first time on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll include a link where you can sign up for the Zoom tasting for free in the show notes. The video will show you the pictures and other visual elements we discuss on this podcast, and I'll be jumping into the comments on all four platforms as we watch it together so I can answer your questions in real time. It's like the Netflix version of the podcast, plus you can talk to me and ask me questions as we watch it together, and you can also see what other people thought of this conversation and the answers to their questions. I want to let you know that you can win one of two tickets to an exclusive virtual wine tasting led by our guest that also includes two bottles of premium wines that will be shipped directly to your home. These tickets are priced at $135 each and enable up to six participants per household to participate. We'll be giving away two tickets, one to each of two different winners. All you need to do is comment on the social media post that I created about the contest. Just pick your favorite platform, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and comment on my post before 7 p.m. tonight. In the show notes, you'll find a link to these posts, the full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube, live every Wednesday on video at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 127. Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show, we've been in lockdown now so long that sometimes I wonder if I'll have to relearn how to socialize the way, you know, someone who's been in an accident sometimes needs physiotherapy to walk again. I know that's very melodramatic, but as an introvert, I naturally gravitate toward being on my own. And so, you know, being forced to do that more during the lockdown hasn't been as hard on me as it has been on more extroverted people. Still, I wonder what happens when everything opens up again. Will getting together, even with friends, feel like a disruption of my perfectly solitary patterns? How about you? Do you think about this too? Okay, on with the show.
I'm sure part of what you're saying applies to our next area, but another area of loathing, it seems, in the industry are social media influencers. So let's first principles do our definitions first. What defines a social media influencer, wine influencer, versus sort of traditional wine journalists or media for you? I think of an influencer truly as being anyone who actually influences opinion on wine. So if you are a journalist who is also an influencer in the space, then that works. I think the traditional definition of an influencer is someone on, say, Instagram or TikTok or social media who uses that platform to promote wine, wine travel, wine brands, whatever it is, a wine lifestyle through imagery, short captions, video. Um, So it's a highly visual medium, which lends itself to wine, if you think about it. I mean, the landscapes in wine country are just stunning and the bottles are gorgeous and the sound of a cork popping and it's a great platform, but there is, yes, there is this frustration in the wine world for the wine influencer. Hmm. So there's obviously probably, again, a protectiveness at stake here from the serious people who have studied the subject. Is there anything else going on in terms of prompting the backlash? I mean, there's been some serious backlash against certain wine influencers. I don't know when it was. A few months ago, there was a hashtag going around. I'll beat myself, but wine. Yeah. And so what is that? What's driving that? So there is a level of frustration that certain wine influencers don't actually have wine credentials and often will post information that is actually incorrect. I think I read somewhere that like we store wine on its side because if we don't, it gets corked or something like that. And I'm grossly butchering that. But there is a frustration among people like students of wine or even just serious wine consumers who are like, that's not even actually correct. So I know you have 50,000 followers, but maybe don't spread misinformation about the wine world. And yeah, and there is a belief in the wine community that influencers don't actually know about wine and they are detracting from the serious wine writers out there. Journalists in particular feel frustrated by it. Like I'm not getting invited to press trips or I am getting invited to press trips and pitched but getting crowded out by the influencers who are there by virtue of their 100,000 followers. Right. And, you know, just posing in a vineyard with a sexy bottle is not necessarily communicating information about the wine. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Well, you quoted Tom Wark, who published an article, and you said, wine writers are generally trying to tell a story, whereas wine influencers are trying to get the right light, something like that. Which I disagree with. I think... A picture tells a story. So worth a thousand words. (laughs) Right. Why do people spend so much money on advertising? It's true. It's a gorgeous photo that's designed to be aspirational in many ways or to communicate a story in a picture. So yes, I think there is a cohort of influencers who perhaps lack proper wine training or the knowledge, but I don't necessarily want to write off wine influencers categorically because there are plenty of wine consumers who don't actually need to know the story of the vineyard and the family and the oak program again and the you know how the vines are trained they really just want to drink the stuff so because the story or the background in the science exists doesn't necessarily mean that that is what's selling the wine to every consumer we all need different things absolutely Yeah. And I think just in terms of how we deal with influencers, even if there is something incorrect, I think it could be more of a, as they say, call in culture rather than call out, rather than shaming and pushing. How about inviting them in, in a kind way and saying, this is, you know, the accuracy or whatever, but not in a like public shaming You know, it's like there is a level of condescension that exists in the wine industry that's incredibly frustrating. And when you talk to everyday wine consumers who aren't scholars of wine, they're frustrated by it. And there's a reason people feel afraid to share their thoughts on wines. There's a reason they feel intimidated in a restaurant to order wine. There's a reason they find it elitist and scary. And it's like the only beverage out there that people are scared by. And it's supposed to be this product of pleasure and inclusion and bringing people together. So let's not make it this scary beast. Absolutely. It's one of the first things that I had to get over just in starting a podcast. I've been writing about wine for 20 years, started the podcast about a year and a half ago. I still had to get over like 
what if I say something wrong? What if I get an appellation wrong or whatever? And it's like, sometimes you have to move beyond your own ego, but also just open yourself up to be vulnerable and to be corrected and hope that someone does it kindly rather than the other way. I mean, Natalie, I'm sitting here like body tense, clenching myself in case I say something (laughs) wrong about wine, right? Like the wine industry loves to beat people up and it's, let's not do that anymore. Yeah. Inclusion, call in. Exactly. All about that. And, and let's not forget that there are plenty of wine influencers out there on social media who have strong wine backgrounds and who have their WSET level three or level two or their Psalms. They have blogs on the side. Like, can we not write them all off? No, exactly. I've worked with plenty and they're great to have on press trips. They're fun. They're engaging. They ask questions. They want to tell the stories. And I think that's the spirit of inclusion and sense of fun and passion and enjoyment that we need. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I don't know, have you ever read the books of Brené Brown? She's U.S. based. Brené Brown. She writes about vulnerability and shame. And she talks about the quote from Theodore Roosevelt that it's not the man in the sidelines, which at the time he's using all male words, but that's okay. Not the people on the sidelines who heckle. It's the man in the arena that's getting grit on his face and blood and whatever that matters. And her opinion is if you're not in the arena, if you're not trying, if you're not opening yourself vulnerably, then I don't want to hear from you. You know, I I don't care. Yeah, I love it too. And it's something that gives me courage, you know, to get out there because online, it is the arena, especially online, social media. Oh God, it's, yeah. Yeah. And so it's great in many ways to connect, like to be able to do these virtual chats and to share it on social media channels and bring more people in, but it comes with the other side too. And so I think the only defense is vulnerability these days is just to admit, yeah, you know what? I'm not perfect. I don't know everything even after 20 years. And it's like, just tell me or whatever. But anyway, so you can unclench there. (laughs) This is not, (laughs) or uh, have a drink, whatever. At least I know where Switzerland is now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Thank goodness for that. (laughs) But that's great. That's disarming to even just put it out there. Yeah. So there are some downsides to influencers. What have you seen or read about that can be sort of the less positive, aside from inaccuracies about wine, other things when it comes to influencers? Yeah. So I work on the PR side as well. So I write about wine, but I also work with clients and promote their regions and their brands and do marketing. And I've worked with my share of influencers and it's not everybody, but yes, there there are some who I think earn influencers a bad name by doing it for the free product or the free trips I get a lot of calls for personal favors and, you know, we all do that. You know, everybody wants to call in a favor and everyone wants to sort of drop a name and I get it, but I do get a lot of calls about, can you set this up for me for a personal visit in exchange for a story or not a static post, but like an Instagram story, or I've had people behave really, really badly when I've hooked up winery visits where they get drunk or they bring their friends and Mm. they sort of earn themselves a bad name. And it's embarrassing for me and it sort of puts me in a bad light, but it's the exception rather than the norm. But I think it has caused frustration in the wine world. So, you know, I think it's important to, as an influencer, really view yourself as a wine professional, if that's what you are going for. Less personal asks, being respectful, not stopping everything to fix your face and get the right light, especially if you're working with other journalists who are there and not necessarily doing that. I think there are ways to get around it, but yeah, there's some bad behaving people and in every barrel. Yeah. Right. Every right. Bunch. It's not limited <laughs> to influencers by any means. <laughs> no, even wine journalists. So yeah. 20 year veterans can <laughs> misbehave. Yes. Yes. Um, so is there a way for the wine industry to deal with influencers? Cause they are like you and I hear this from wineries. They are deluged with requests for samples and everything else. How do you deal with all of this? From an industry perspective, is there, I don't know, I doubt we can get into certification, but is it just word of mouth or an informal registry? What, what is the way to deal with this? I mean, it's on the brand who is bringing in an influencer to set the parameters and set them properly and really negotiate that contract, even if it's an informal contract with an influencer to say, here is my expectation, here is what I would like in exchange for 
here's the agreement. When you come on my property, then we expect a static post, a blog post, a three photos that we can then use, you know, whatever the contract is or whatever the agreement is so that the brand can always tie it to ROI. And I think that is at the end of the day, what we're all looking for is the ROI on that exchange. And, you know, the same thing for the PR, like I have to constantly defend or media to my clients to say, here's what this actually means. So yeah, it's just, it's on the brands to really outline expectations and then go from there to decide whether or not working with an influencer is right for them. It must be hard to tie, like even with influencers or say an Instagrammer who has whatever, 50,000 followers or more, it must still be a challenge to say, because she, and they tend to be mostly female, posted this, we got X sales. Like it must be hard to tie it together. I mean, can you at all? Um, I think marketers have an easier time with it because they can actually sort of embed things and kind of track conversions better. But when it comes to influencers and publicists and PR people, it is tricky and we can quote impressions data all day long, but does it necessarily translate to sales conversions? So I think when you look at a program over time, you can track things like the tone that's being used, the mentions, you know, are we moving the business forward long term and looking at any relationship with an influencer or a publicist, I think it has to be viewed long term. Yes. What is the trajectory here? But I know there are some very smart gals in the wine industry who are working on this very problem right now. So, yes. Is there any details you can share yet? Or that makes me curious. Uh, I don't know that I can formally share any details, but I had a phenomenal conversation with a gal named Rachel Woods, if anyone wants to Google her in the wine space, who is working on, she's sort of like a data nerd. She comes from Facebook and, you know, we had this great conversation. She's working with an influencer, Wine with Paige, as well to solve this problem. And we've been having some really interesting conversations about ways that influencers can better sort of, I guess, merchandise their offerings in terms of real trackable ROI. And I think it applies to PR people as well. Absolutely. That's one of those softer things. And yet it's vital because we know the marketing cycle or even funnel, the sales funnel starts at the very top with awareness and then moves to liking and so on. And it's only at the bottom that you get to purchase and repeat purchase, but it has to start with that awareness, which is where PR and Perhaps Instagram and others play such a vital part. Well, if you ask any of your friends, what makes you pick a certain bottle of wine? How do you pick your wines? And a lot of my friends will say, well, I base it on your recommendations, or I see someone mention something on social media and and I go from there. Or they pick it by the pretty label or whatever it is. You know, for the most part, the average consumer isn't digging into the wine ratings in Wine Spectator. Not that those don't have an incredibly valuable place. Oh, it's true. Peer-to-peer is super important. Peer-to-peer is very important. And I find, or at least when I publish my two books, people often told me that they had heard about it, say, in three different ways, like from a friend, then they saw maybe a display in the bookstore, but then they saw a TV interview or something. But it was that third hit or whatever that finally said, oh, I should, I should look for that. And so, again, these tools are in that toolkit. And It's often a combination of things before the person actually moves to buy or to whatever, try. Yeah. I mean, I I think any smart brand will understand the role that social media, traditional media, marketing, public relations all play. And a really comprehensive program that encompasses all of those pillars is sort of a winning bet. Yeah, absolutely. So the... um, Third area I want to talk about, because I'm sure a lot of people, both inside and outside the wine industry, you don't have to be inside the wine industry to wonder, I'm sure we've all had the thoughts, am I drinking too much wine? And you wrote a really interesting piece about people in the wine industry, whether they're writers or retailers. I mean, there's just so many different jobs you can do within the wine industry. Are they drinking too much wine? And has it become sort of a way of doing business? Maybe you could Tell us a little bit about that. So I found myself, I think it was maybe two years ago, I was on back to back to back to back trips, press trips, sales trips, business trips, where I just found there to be an excess of 
consumption. And don't get me wrong, like I love to drink. I love it. Wine is my business. It's my passion. And and I do drink wine every day and it's part of my lifestyle. But I just found I was getting up and doing a tasting and then having wine at lunch and then another tasting and then another tasting. And then we were having cocktails before dinner and then, you know, a cocktail at dinner and then a bottle of wine at dinner. And then, oh, we all have to go out for drinks after. And I kind of felt like, is this a little much? Like, and there was a pressure to do it. Like if you decided you were done and you wanted to go to bed after dinner, it was like you got shamed. So yeah, you likened it to college hazing or whatever. It was almost ritualistic that you couldn't be the party kill or the buzz kill. Right. And then you're expected to wake up the next morning and start all over again at 8.30 a.m. with this presentation, this wine tasting. And it just feels like a lot. And I don't know that it's all necessary. Right. But the people would ask, aren't you spitting or, you know, did it still affect you? Or is there real also drinking involved in addition to tasting? Yes. So at trade tastings and professional tastings, I mean, I always, always spit and it's to avoid getting inebriated, but it's also to keep my mind fresh so that I can taste properly. But, you know, I've been on certain press trips where no one is spitting or, you know, few people are spitting. And certainly at lunch, when the wine is served, you're not spitting. That's part of your lunch. And then you have the cocktails. So even if I took all the daytime tasting out, it's still the wine or the cocktails with lunch. It's still the drink before dinner. It's still the wine at dinner. And then it's still the cocktails after, which is fine every once in a while. But when you're sort of doing rinse, repeat on that day after day, and I think a lot of people in the industry look at it as a must, like you need to go do this because it's earning business. It's making those connections. I found myself wondering, like, is it though? Is this really closing the deal for me? whether it's a story or whether it's the sale, does this need to happen? And I think when we are looking at this sober curious movement in the dry Januaries and the low no alcohol options out there, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Like we got to be careful. Right. Yeah. They're the flip sides of, of two extremes, as you observed. I have to agree. Like, you know, I've been on wine tours and they do start early in the morning and, you know, <laughs> dinner is scheduled at 10 p.m. Oh, God, yeah. Especially in Europe, you're like, uh, you're not eating until 1030 at night. No, exactly. And you get to the dinner and the winemaker would be like insulted if you weren't trying the wines. But then over dinner, there are no spittoons like while you're actually eating and they're serving the wines. And yes, you can just say no, but just sitting there looking kind of <laughs> glum or not drinking. I mean, they're watching what you're doing, too if you're drinking, but I almost found some of those agendas so tightly packed to be a form of violence. Like it was just an assault, a physical assault from even sometimes starting as early as seven in the morning and going to tasting after tasting after, you know, and I know those trips are expensive. If you're sponsored by a winery council, I get that. And I want to get as much out of it as possible too. I want to review as many wines as I can. I want to write as much as I can based on that because you know, I want a good investment of my time, but there was no time even to go for a walk. It was insane. Yeah. I will never forget a press trip I did through all of Spain. And it was one of my favorite press trips of all time. But I remember staying out one night until five in the morning for those, like you had to have the gin and tonics from this place and after dinner. And, and then the next morning we were scheduled at a cooperage for like seven in the morning or eight in the morning. And it's like, if for anyone who doesn't know what that is, like we listened to hammering and sawing of barrel making and everybody was hungover. And it was just That's just like, mean. <laughs> Kill me now. But you know, I, in the same way that I do my virtual tastings, I love seeing people like regions and wine regions. So the tourism side and the wine side coming together to create an itinerary that incorporates elements of other things like wellness, you know, like let's schedule in yoga or a spa treatment or a walk or whatever it is so that people don't feel quite as assaulted to your point um, <laughs> yeah. by the yeah. barrage of wine and barrel making. Absolutely. Cause stories can be written about visiting the region and that's not going to be just drinking or eating. It's going to include those other activities because everybody wants that sort of full experience of a region? Well, I always say we don't drink wine in a vacuum. Wine is part of our broader lifestyle. We drink it while consuming entertainment or, you know, wellness or business or whatever it is. It's cooking. It's, it's part of something bigger. Absolutely. I love that. 
the wine industry, of course, and, and maybe more largely than that, the beverage alcohol, you're selling a product that is alcohol. So of course you're going to meet and try the product, but why do you think it has gone to this excess? Is it because the wine industry or the beverage industry attracts people who want to drink to excess? Or why do you think it's become the norm to go to those extremes to do business? I think it sort of represents, and again, it's that symptom of the bigger problem. It represents an old school view. So if anyone's ever watched Mad Men, you know, everyone's having cocktails at lunch. It's a very male dominated culture and they're pouring the scotch, at, you know, to have a meeting at 10 a.m. And I think the wine industry is traditionally male dominated. It's changing now, but it has been. And there was this old school notion of this is how we do business. And when I was a sales rep in New York, that was how we did business. I think it's changing and there is a movement to introduce more moderation in a more feminine way, for lack of a better way of putting it. If anyone's familiar with a balanced glass, it's a community yes. to talk Kathy. about Yeah, right. wellness yeah. in uh, the drinks business. And, and so I'm thrilled to see that movement happening. But I think it does tie back to just the old school way of doing business. And that doesn't just apply to wine. I think it applies to business in general. And in a traditionally male dominated industry, that was it. And you're sort of expected to keep up in particular as a woman who's trying to prove herself. Right. Yeah. You don't need to have another hurdle, as you said, in uh, making your gender more pronounced that you can't keep up with the boys, as you say. But again, you get those two extremes. You've got this old way of doing business. And yet the flip side, sort of the puritanical side of even the wine industry came out, at least for me, when, you know, when my first book was called Red, White, and Drunk All Over. And Such it was a, a bit book. of a, oh, thank you. <laughs> but it was a poke at trying to be irreverent about wine. But also, I went to many regions, like tasting and drinking wine. So that was the title. But there was a backlash against the title saying you shouldn't be promoting this. And, you know, I wasn't trying to promote immoderation, but there was almost a puritanical reaction from the wine industry itself about that title. And yet you have the excesses, these two extremes again, that you you talk about in, in some of your pieces. It's interesting why more of it can't come to a center of moderation and mindful drinking and whatever, but maybe that's hope for the future. <laughs> I don't <laughs> well, know. Look at all the, the rules and regulations in the US wine industry are a result of prohibition, right? So it's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We're still, li- we're still living with that. What do you think about all the wine memes, the wine mom memes, I should say, like the mommy juice referring to wine and things like that. What's your take on that? I'm fine with it. And I live for memes. Sometimes I communicate with my husband, like only in memes. Um, (laughs) I'm fine with it. What I don't like is the backlash against those memes because I'm a mom of two little boys and I drink wine and I'm not a train wreck. I get up and do my job. I don't need it to live and get through the day. And But you know what? I do get through a lot of incidents with my kids by like, oh my God, someone pour me a glass. So I sort of take offense to it being used as a pejorative, I guess, because I'm a mom and I drink wine and I get overwhelmed and yeah, I need a drink sometimes to deal with it, but it doesn't mean I'm a train wreck. And I think sometimes there is the implication that you're a train wreck if you're sort of thought of as a wine mom and it's dismissive. But I think the memes are funny and kind of legit. <laughs> Absolutely. I have forgotten to share photos. I want to do that. I know we're heading into overtime here. So I could sit talk wine all day. Yes, me I too. I just need a glass. It's like exactly on here, but <laughs> <laughs> that's right. 7 30 a.m. your time right now. No, I think it's 5 5 30 somewhere, right? Okay, yeah. It's gotta be. <laughs> Can you see the picture now? Yeah, me in a tank. You in a (laughs) tank. Where are you in this picture besides in a tank? Where are you? So one of my very favorite clients in the whole world is the region of Temecula Valley, Southern California wine country. And that photo was taken at Peltzer Winery in Temecula, where they had brought in some brand new tanks. And I was like, I got to get in this thing. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it's new because don't people die of CO2 or sometimes? Oh, no, it had never been used. Yes, this was like, Brand spanking new. 
I love that. Guaranteed quality right above your head. <laughs> <laughs> Little essence of Devin. Yeah, there you go. I love your sense of humor. Here are your tasting. Is this in Temecula or somewhere else? Yes, that is actually in Temecula at South Coast Winery. We were creating, well, I wasn't, but I was sort of getting to participate by tasting. We were creating a wine blend to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the region. And so that was me tasting one of the components there. Where is Temecula? Like, can you situate it? We all know where San Francisco is, Napa and Sonoma are north. I assume you're going south, but kind of where is it? So Temecula Valley is about an hour outside of San Diego, uh, northeast. It's in Riverside County, but it is within a one to two hour drive of literally every major Southern California city. So like an hour from Orange County, hour from San Diego, hour from Palm Springs, two hours from LA. So it's wow. a great region. And do they specialize kind of in the same grapes like Syrah, Cabernet, Chardonnay that are sort of well known in warmer regions of California? Yeah, it's a Mediterranean climate that's moderated by the Pacific Ocean through this big gap in the mountains. So it actually gets quite cold at night and in the mornings um, and in the afternoons. I mean, they do a lot of great Mediterranean varieties, Syrah, Sangiovese, Barbera, Vermentino, Grenache. Oh, wow. Lots of Italian, too. Okay. This is you at a wine tasting, I assume. I think that's me at SOMCON. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Doing a seminar there. All right. Cool. And is this a pairing? Oh, the San Diego Food and Wine Festival. So you're pairing guacamole, dim sum, time? That was just, yeah, that was my Temecula crew at the San Diego Bay Wine and Food Festival. Just, I've been with those gals forever. So having some fun. Fun. Do you have a favorite pairing tip for guac or dim sum or time? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I always love the aromatic whites for sort of spicy Asian and exotic cuisine. Guac, you know what? I'm not going to lie. I'm going to crack a Corona or a beer of some sort. Like I just have to. Thyme, you know, those herbs, I love like an earthy red. Hmm. Something like a Rhone blend or like a poopy gamay or something. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Love those descriptors. And you're into wellness. What are you doing here? Kickboxing? This is so bizarre, but at the tender age of 40, so I think last year, I took up karate. Oh, good for you. Yes. I've always had this secret desire to be a ninja. Like it really, it's it's bad. There it is. Yes. That was my husband and my kids. Oh, wow. And my oldest son started taking karate and I watched and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And yeah, working toward that black belt. Your kids are adorable. There they are. Thanks. Oh my gosh. You're working toward a black belt. Wow. And look at them. They're into it too. Green belt. Where is that? Midway through? So that last one was a blue white belt. Yeah, that's it's um it's getting there. Okay. <laughs> Probably a couple more years. That's great. Are you a runner as well? I try to do it all. <laughs> I mean, not at all. I don't do it all well, but I think it's my way of sort of balancing my food and wine lifestyle that I feel a lot better about that glass of wine if I get out and move my body and it helps with my anxiety and I sleep better. So yeah, that was me after a run. My husband is like an incredible competitive runner and does ultra marathons and marathons. So, you know, I don't necessarily keep up. Have you guys ever done the Maydoc marathon in Bordeaux? No, but that sounds amazing. If I didn't have to actually run the marathon. (laughs) Exactly. You get to run through, I don't know, 23 of the greatest chateaux, and they have wines out at the stations. As the runners go by, you can partake. So it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I finished 10 hours later. (laughs) (laughs) He's staggering across the finish line. (laughs) I love this photo. (laughs) That's one of your sons, obviously. Yes, that is at an airport lounge. I literally like cannot fly without having a glass, whether it's six in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. So he was photobombing me as I was <laughs> enjoying the joys of traveling with small children. Uh-huh. And speaking of that, <laughs> is this him? No, that was that's my youngest son when he was just born. So he's five now, but you know, live in the vineyard life. That was at Robert Renzoni Vineyards. And I took him out and he was not thrilled, but I was apparently. I thought it was funny. That's so sweet. Oh my goodness. And what is this? Are you a baker? That is me in my house in Italy, which I I don't have a house in Italy, but when I lived there, I was renting a place making pasta from scratch. Oh, wow. I look at my brown hair. (laughs) That's great. Very authentic. Is that in Italy? 
no, that's my mom and me at the Cordon Bleu in Pasadena taking a cooking class together. So that's one of my biggest passions is cooking and you know they kind of goes hand in hand with wine but love to cook it does absolutely and so does she she's incredible fantastic and this must be at a wine show with Temecula wines yeah that was at a wine spectator event and I was spreading the Temecula Valley gospel (laughs) literally yes all right those are great Devin really great we're going to wrap up because this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention before I get to where we can find you online? Oh my gosh. Um, I would love to see anybody join me for virtual tastings, of course. And I think, you know, not to shameless plug, but I work with some cool brands doing them and we always try to incorporate an element of lifestyle. So I've got one coming up. I'm working with two gals from the Toronto Symphony and they're doing a performance and we're pairing wines with the classical music. Um, I bring in chefs and they're really fun. And like I said, I'm a big believer that wine is part of a broader lifestyle. And I think everything I do tries to live up to that. Great ideas. So where can we find you online? My website is devinpar.com. That's D-E-V-I-N par, P-A-R-R.com. And on Instagram, I'm at the SoCal Wine Gal. Those are the places I live. Awesome. And just a reminder to everyone watching or listening, Devin has generously offered two tickets, premium tickets to one of her virtual tastings. And all you have to do is pick your social media platform of choice and post about a wine. Tag me so I make sure to get you into that contest. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for that and for this wonderful conversation. This has been absolutely terrific. So fun. Like I said, I can sit here all day. This is great. Thanks so much, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Great way to start my day. Absolutely. (laughs) Take care. Bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed part two of my chat with Devin Parr. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I agree with Devin that an influencer is anyone who actually influences opinion on why, not just those with official certifications. I believe, too, there's a role for many voices, particularly in the wine industry, where we need them. Two, she makes a great point. We don't drink wine in a vacuum. Wine is part of our broader lifestyle. I just wish more media trips would incorporate that. That's why I stopped going on them altogether. And three, yes, there have been times when I know I've consumed too much wine though usually this has been at home rather than an industry event, thank goodness. But I think it's something the wine industry needs to address more openly and talk about, as do we all, if we love wine and want to keep it as part of our lives. Just a reminder that you can win one of two tickets to an exclusive virtual wine tasting led by Devon, and that includes two bottles of premium wines that will be shipped directly to your home. All you have to do is comment on the social media posts that I created about the contest before 7 p.m. tonight. I'll select a winner randomly from those of you who participate. And you get a bonus entry for every wine love and friend you tag or if you reshare the post in your stories. In the show notes, you'll find a link to these posts, the full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube, live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including tonight. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 127. You won't want to miss next week when Ron Hunt, host of the All About Wine podcast, interviews me. (laughs) Ron is a winemaker, cellar master, vineyardist, and tasting expert. I absolutely love chatting with him about my experiences in the wine industry. In the meantime, if you missed episode 25, go back and take a listen. Wine expert and yoga master Morgan Perry and I chat about pairing wine and yoga. Go figure. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Because I come from a wine marketing background and also my personal beliefs are really to be socially responsible. That comes first before everything. So we actually don't drink any wine during the yoga class. We just drink at the end, but we are learning about the wine during the class. So how it works is a 45 minute flow. I will teach you 
maybe 20 wine facts. So I actually taught at a vineyard today and we went through, we learned about Chardonnay. I gave them about 20 facts about Chardonnay and they're holding poses that are kind of easy to pose. So if you're a yogi, you'll know warrior two, chair pose. You may argue with me about if that one's easy to hold. Downward facing dog. Sometimes I have them in child's pose if I'm talking a little bit longer. So those kinds of poses where I can give you a quick fact and then we move through a vinyasa. So we keep their bodies moving, but then they'll pause for a fact. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the tips that Devin shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full body bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.